So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming along, both panelists and, and students. My name is Joss Harrison. I'm one of the careers consultants at the university's career service, and I'm going to be hosting this event for the, the next hour. Um, before we kind of get going with the event for proper, I'd just like to run through a few housekeeping points with you. So what I'm going to do is just share my screen and hopefully, all being well, you will be able to see my slides. Could I have, Ange, could I have a thumbs up if you can see the slides? Brilliant, thank you. Right, so this afternoon you're going to be hearing about a kind of another branch of um, science careers outside the lab. So we're going to be looking at science communication, education and outreach. And as I said, just a little bit of the housekeeping before we get going. Um, the first thing to say is this session is being recorded and we're doing that so that you can come back to it later. Uh, we're hoping to make it available on our YouTube channel. So if you don't want to appear in the recording, please do make sure that your camera is turned off. Um, we really would really encourage you to use this opportunity to ask our panelists lots of questions about um, what they're doing at the moment, how they got to where they are, kind of to, to, to ask for their advice, etc. It's, it's a fantastic opportunity to have such a kind of great range of experienced people together. Um, each of the panelists is going to introduce themselves for five minutes. And whilst that is going on, please do use the chat box to submit any questions that you have. And um, I, I will pick them up um, and we will make sure that they are kind of included in the Q&A. The bulk of the session is going to be for your questions for the Q&A. And so during that formal bit of the Q&A, if you're happy to have your camera on, we would really, really like that. Um, it, I think it's so much nicer if people can see faces. Um, we would ask you to use the reactions function to put your hand up so that we can see you've got a question. You'll be unmuted so that you can ask your question. And um, then when that's all done, we would ask that you put your hand down again, just so we don't end up with lots of, of hands in the air. Okay, let me just check. I think those were the kind of main um, housekeeping things I had to let you know about. Let's move on. And here is an overview of this afternoon's panelists. Um, you, you may well have already seen um, their profiles on our website and you're gonna hear from them in person. So I'm gonna leave them to introduce themselves. I would just say, please, you know, think about your questions and just thank you very much to the panelists. So I'm gonna hand over to the first of the panelists, um, who is Laura Holland from the Rosalind Frank Institute. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That. And Laura, yes. Thanks, Joss. Um, welcome everyone. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, as Joss says, I'm Laura Holland. I am Director of Communications and Culture at the Rosalind Franklin Institute. So I think I'm winning the most esoteric and longest job title of everyone here. Um, unless you spell out STEM in one of the other titles, in which case they're definitely <laughs> it. Um, so I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about my background and what led me to this role. Um, I went to school in Morpeth, which is um, a town in Northumberland that some of you might be familiar with um, from studying at Newcastle. Um, my first degree was at Durham University. I went off and did cell biology there. Um, and I think I was, I was enthused about biology because the time I went to university was around the time that they were doing the Human Genome Project. There was a lot of biology in the media. That there was a huge amount of excitement about what, what biology could do. So I was very keen on the kind of the public face of, of biology even at that point. Um, I got to the end of my undergraduate degree and to cut a long story, sto sh sto long sh story short, I hadn't quite decided what I wanted to do. I didn't know whether I wanted to do a PhD. Um, I'd, I'd worked quite a bit in different roles and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that, how that gave me some direction later, but I hadn't really settled on what it was I was gonna do. So I hid in education for another year. 
um, and I did that at Newcastle. So I did a master's um, in the medical school in uh, biomedical science, uh, which I loved um, and combined that with quite a bit more work experience, which again, I'll, I'll touch on later. So my research there was all about um, the link between socioeconomic deprivation and health. So it wasn't a lab based masters. It wasn't lab based research. And I think that really opened my eyes a little bit to what, what science could look like outside the lab. It really widened my, my perspective on research. Um, and it also underlined to me that I'm just not good enough at statistics to do this for a career. So having done my extra year in education, I then went off and um, actually got a job with uh, the place where I worked when I was an undergraduate, which was the Centre for Life in Newcastle. So while I was studying at Durham, um, I worked as a science explainer at the Centre for Life, uh, which is my favourite job title to date. Being a science explainer was just brilliant. Um, and I ran, when I was there, I ran workshops, I did uh, teaching for schools, I did weekend, I operated the motion ride for any of you who've been there. I don't know whether you've had the fun of going to the Centre for Life yet. Um, but a whole wide range of uh, very hands-on roles and I just loved talking to people about science and I, I realised eventually um, during my master's that the thing I loved about science was talking about and it wasn't necessarily doing it. So I was looking for jobs that would enable me to to feel that contact and that excitement and that, that proximity to science without having the frankly the risk of breaking expensive equipment in the lab which did happen more than once. Um, during my undergraduate degree. So at the Centre for Life, I was the uh, Science Festival coordinator. So I, I was running events, I was organising lectures, I was managing programmes of activity, um, predominantly for adult audiences, but, but whatever needed to be done. I think the Newcastle Science Festival um, doesn't happen anymore, although I would like to be clear it wasn't me that killed it. Um, it was funded by an, a regional development agency that, that is defunct now. Um, but we had about 200,000 people a year would come along to our, um, our activities that took place all over the city. It was, it was a brilliant, brilliant event. Um, and I did that for a couple of years. I then went off and decided what I, that I wanted to be even closer to science. I wanted to get back into a more research environment rather than a public engagement environment. Um, and I went off uh, to the south down to Diamond Light Source in Oxfordshire. So Diamond is a synchrotron, it's a type of particle accelerator. Um, it's very physics-y, so for a biologist, having to get my head around explaining um, and communicating physics and chemistry and, um, and figuring out how to tell small children how magnets work, there was lots and lots of challenge there. Um, my initial role was very much in public engagement, but over the course of, of the decade or so that I was there, um, as well as two maternity leaves, I also I moved into more of a corporate communications role. So that means I was doing more media work, I was doing more stakeholder work, so thinking about who funds us, who, um, who would be interesting in collaborating with us, as well as the sort of public, um, public engagement work. Eventually, I got sick of magnets and wanted to be closer to biology again. And that's when I moved across um, all of a hundred yards across the road um, at Harwell, where we're based, uh, to the Rosalind Franklin Institute. So that's a brand new institute. We've, uh, our building hasn't even opened yet. We've just taken possession of it. Um, and that's an institute that is all about creating technologies for life science. So now I'm, I'm Director of Communications and Culture, which means I look at um, all aspects of our corporate communication. I look at who we talk to, what we say to them, um, what, those, what those messages need to be. I work with the press when we have um, interesting science stories. Um, I work with our funders, I work with public audiences. Um, and the culture side is because I work with our researchers and staff on what a good research culture should look like, how we talk to each other as researchers, how we, um, how we build an environment that is mutually respectful, that is everything we'd want it to be, um, and lots of um, equality and diversity stuff as well. So I still get to do the, my favourite things, which are talk about science without doing it. Um, I work with some of the most interesting researchers in the whole world. They are just unbelievable, the things that we're doing. Um, and to an extent, a corporate communications is, is not an add-on to an organisation. And if you're doing it right and it's in the right place, you are right next to the directors, you're right in the decision-making group. Um, so I'm able to drive the whole direction of an institute in a way that is 
just incredibly exciting to be able to do. Um, so that's me in five minutes. I think I'm more or less on time, um, but I really look forward to taking any questions on, on what this side of the world looks like. And I think I'm handing over to Kate now. Hi, so um, I'm Kate Holden. I'm the Learning Officer at the Great North Museum Hancock, which you may have spotted as you wander up Claremont Road on the opposite side from campus. Um, so I, I feel slightly fraudulent in, in giving people ideas about how to follow a trackway because I, I kind of feel I've blundered from thing to thing, but I've, I've quite enjoyed it. Um, so my first degree um, was in geography. Um, and I was particularly interested in the kind of geomorphology, uh, climate history, that kind of thing, side of stuff. And I went on to do a PhD um, in scientific dating. So you might have come across things like radiocarbon dating. This was a, a method called luminescence dating. Um, and I was finding out how old sand dunes were. Um, and I enjoyed doing that. It took me to all sorts of exciting places. I did um, some field work in um, various bits of the western United States and um, Skegness and other kind of uh, exotic places like that. Um, I worked as a postdoc for a few years um, doing a, a combination of lab work and, and field work after that. I went on to be a university lecturer um, in geography um, but I was um, one of these people who um, was on was a casually employed, not casually employed, but an annual contracts and eventually that kind of ground to a halt. Um, and I found myself redundant um, and shortly thereafter pregnant. Um, and so I spent a few years at home with my family and um, I then started thinking, well, what, what do I do now? Because, you know, there's only so long you can go without an income. Um, and um, I started to volunteer in my children's school um, with an idea of just getting some kind of um, some um, experience of, of working with young people, well, younger than 18 year olds. Um, and as I was kind of looking around for things to do, um, I spotted an advert for um, the science learning person at the Great North Museum. And I loved going there. I loved the collections. And I thought, oh, that looks like fun. I'll never get it, but I'll, I'll apply because I'm in the habit of applying for things. And I got the job and it's been brilliant. I love working at the museum. Um, I love the fact that I'm doing my science communication through objects and through um, getting um, young people handling things and finding out about stuff in a really kind of um, investigative way. Um, I worked as the science um, assistant learning officer for several years and now I'm the learning officer so I'm in charge of the archaeology program um, as well as the science program. Uh, I get engaged in um, helping to set up exhibitions. Um, I work with lots of researchers from Newcastle University um, because we're the University Museum and we um, do lots of work about trying to make um, research accessible to the public because the thing about a museum is we're a very trusted institution uh, and that means that you know we're a great place to actually be talking about things that people might find hard, like climate change. Um, I work with schools mainly, but also with other sectors of the public. Um, and I work, again, the great thing about the museum, we're a very small team. So I get to work across lots of different kinds um, of job role within the museum. Um, so I'm gonna stop there but um by all means ask any questions you want to um it'll be great to speak to you um in a little while and i think i'm heading up uh, handing on to adam uh yes thank you case um i've just got some slides i'm just gonna bring up okay can everyone see that Grace. Okay. Um, yeah. So hello, everyone. It's great to be back in Newcastle uh, Uni, albeit virtually. So my name is Adam Jowett. I'm a medical writer at Ashfield Health. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my, my background uh, and how I came to work in medical communications. So like many of you, I'm a student of Newcastle Uni or was a student a few years ago now. So I studied chemistry with medicinal chemistry MCHEM for four years at Newcastle University. Um, and, you know, I love my time at Newca Newcastle, I'd happily do it again. Um, and I, I really enjoyed my course as well. I really enjoyed 
learning about chemistry and in particular drug discovery and drug chemistry. Um, thankfully, doing the medicinal chemistry aspect that covered that. Um, so initially, when I was doing a degree, I thought, oh, maybe I'd you know, quite like to do a PhD or work in a lab-based role or something like that. And then it came to my final year where I did my research project where I was based in the lab kind of full-time, basically, as it would be in a PhD or a full-time job. And I just did not enjoy it. Like, I, I appreciated the many aspects of it, but it just wasn't what I wanted to do long term. So I kind, of, I kind of got back to square one in the sense that, you know, like, oh, what, what do we do now? You know, kind of stuck in that respect. So I um, graduated summer 2018. I actually, um, uh, straight after graduating, went to work at um, one of the main banks. Um, obviously very scientific. Now, that was just kind of like a stopover job that I did for nearly a year, actually. But while I was working there, I was looking for kind of more long term roles like graduate roles that would um allow me to kind of use what i learned from my degree and things like that um and so for for the whole year i was kind of looking for jobs that you know allow me to use the scientific background but there wasn't really anything that particularly interested me most stuff was lab based and as i knew i didn't want to work in the lab but while i knew i didn't want a lab based career what i did enjoy about my the lab part of my degree was actually kind of communicating the results that um, I, I did from my research project, communicating them through my dissertation, through uh, putting together my uh, project presentation and things like that. Um, so that was all in, in the back of my mind that I, I did really enjoy that part of my degree, but I had no idea if, you know, that was, that I, I could kind of do that in a sense in a, in a job. But that's, eventually I came across um, medical communications and which, advertised for medical writer roles and when I looked into that that was kind of exactly what I wanted to do so uh, so I after a few applications I uh, was offered a I was offered a job as an associate medical writer for Ashfield Health through their Allegro program so the Allegro program I won't to talk too much about but it's basically their training program uh, from so which is like 12 months training people from an associate medical writer or a junior medical writer uh, up, up until becoming a proper proper medical writer in inverted commas as I am now. Um, so now I'm a medical writer at Ashfield, based in Manchester officially. But um, since the uh, since working at home, which I think is exactly a year today now, I think about it, um, I've been based uh, at home in Birkenhead in the Wirral. So what is medical writing? Um, so you might look at me the term medical writing or medical writers and think that. It's uh, just writing things that are related to medicine. And that is true to an extent, but there's a lot more to it. I think the best way to describe it is, uh, as it's outlined here in the title, is the medical writers work on projects that raise awareness of diseases and therapy options. So as a medical writer day to day, I work on a number of projects that are related to a specific disease, a specific uh, campaign or a specific drug, and basically, um, working within a team to create a uh, raise awareness of it and create content relating to that so as you can see on the slide there's a number of kind of um uh, uh things that as a medical writer i'll be involved in so there's actual long writing like manuscripts con um abstracts and publications and things like that there's also medical um educational materials online materials um a lot of stuff we'll do is related to events like so lot there'll be a large at the moment i'm working on a large scale rheumatology congress uh, taking part place in may and I'm basically just doing working all day to kind of create the materials needed for that like speaker slides and um promotional materials um also you see um, advisory boards so well. i think those are really interesting because they're kind of almost like top secret meetings uh between uh, the pharmaceutical, uh, a pharmaceutical company and uh, healthcare professionals uh, and as a medical writer I'll be like taking notes for that and writing up the report um, and yes yeah, so effectively our teams work alongside uh, large-scale pharmaceutical companies and healthcare professionals to uh, raise uh, to create materials and raise awareness um, of of diseases and therapy options a lot of the time it will be all our materials will kind of be 
relating to one specific drug. So the pharmaceutical company will have one drug that they've got a massive campaign on. And uh, as an agency, all our work is kind of relating to that. Um, so that's kind of a uh, brief ov overview in a nutshell of what I do as a medical writer. Um, I'll kind of, if anyone has any questions on that later, I'll happily uh, answer. But I think now it's time to hand over. So I think I'm handing over to Lucy. Thanks, Adam. Well, so hello everyone. Um, as the screen says, my name is Lucy Mason and I work for Teach First. My person profile said that I'm a development lead. Um, last week I found I've been successful in a new role at Teach First. I'm now the co-head of science um, and a development lead for Teach First and I'll explain what that means in a bit. So a bit about me in terms of my background, um, science and maths at A level, went on to study biological sciences at Oxford. Um, and I was thrilled to have Richard Dawkins as my tutor my first year, who was like my hero at the time. So that's my claim to fame before he did all the God stuff. Uh, this was back in the selfish gene days. Um, and when I sort of finished my degree there, I was really unsure about what I wanted to do. It sort of resonates with a couple of the speakers already. Uh, and I got a PhD place to study molecular virology. Spent one day in the lab on a sort of taster day with my new professor and thought, this isn't for me. I just am not detail orientated enough. And I don't want to be sort of in this lab with these mosquito larvae for the next four years. I'm going to change tack. So what Laura said about um, I enjoy talking about science rather than doing science really resonated with me. And that was the sort of light bulb moment that I had there. So I didn't know what I was going to do, um, but saw an advert for Teach First and was really drawn in by uh, the sort of values driven mission of Teach First as a teacher training route, placing people in schools in disadvantaged areas. So I'd got into Oxford from a sort of Northern Access scheme uh, and I thought this really speaks to me, it's something that I want to do. So I took a gap year and then I started Teach First, uh, got placed at a school in central London, which I just loved, uh, I loved teaching. I could walk my classes across Regent's Park to the zoo for trips, which was brilliant. Um, and yeah, I just, I just absolutely loved teaching and thought, education, this is, this is where I want to be. So I stayed in teaching until 2016. I moved back north um, for a boy, that didn't work out, but that's another story. Um, and then a job came up at Teach First, sort of teacher teaching, so sort of training uh, teachers, which I thought that sounds really interesting to me because I like the puzzle of, of sort of supporting adults as well as pupils. So my first role at Teach First, I worked across all subjects and also phases, I did primary and secondary. Um, you know, every single subject of the curriculum learned loads about secondary education and supported lots and lots of teachers as they went on their journey to qualify. Then from 2019, I started a new role where I now design the science teacher training um, that we deliver as an organisation. So I've actually connected back more to science in the past uh, couple of years. I'm currently um, prepping my A-level physics to make sure that I can represent physics as well as I do biology and chemistry. Uh, so in my job, I sort of design all the training that new teachers are going to receive um, and then deliver that. So I actually am in a lab some of the time, but in a, in a school lab, delivering that to them. We work closely with the Department for Education and Ofsted sort of quality assuring the teacher training that we deliver. And yeah, I work really hard to um, put together what I hope is a really inspiring uh, teacher training experience uh, for our teachers. I get to go and visit them in schools normally. I'm on the roads a lot, going to sit in the back of their classrooms, watching their lessons, talking to them about how that went and what they could do better. That's normally a big bit of my job, but I actually haven't left this room for a year with COVID. So um, it's been very strange supporting new teachers without being able to get in and see what they're doing in the classroom. Um, over the past couple of years, I've done an MA in educational leadership, uh, which has been you know, brilliant and I'm, I'm considering Back to PhD again, but this time uh, with an education focus um, sort of to, to further my work. So I never knew that science teacher training was a career, but that's definitely where I see myself. And I think it's something I feel really passionate about because we've got a real science teacher shortage and crisis in this country. Um, and we absolutely need brilliant people to come into the profession. So if you're interested in joining teaching, I um, would love to talk to you uh, more about that when we get to questions. And I think that's everything I wanted to say. I'm going to hand over to Sadie. 
Yep. Um, thank you, Lucy. Um, I, so yeah, I'm Sadie. Um, like Lucy, I also uh, received a promotion last week. So I am now the, uh, if I get this right, product program manager for primary maths and secondary subjects, which again, I will explain later on. Um, but yeah, so I graduated in 2013 with a BSc in chemistry. Um, I knew even during my A-levels that I wasn't particularly interested in a, in a lab-based career. Um, I didn't find it particularly interesting, but I did really enjoy learning about science and I was interested in education, but, and I feel quite guilty saying this having just followed Lucy, but I knew I didn't want to be a teacher. <laughs> um, so, um, so uh, and during my degree, I had the opportunity to do a um, lit review dissertation as opposed to a research project. So kind of these things, um, led me to think that I've been more interested in sort of non-fictional educational publishing as opposed to lab-based work. Um, and I was lucky enough to get an internship at Oxford University Press, which was supposed to be eight weeks. And uh, eight years later, I'm still there. Um, so I've, um, so I started off in the UK secondary education science team. So where we used to make, well, we still do. We make resources for um, key stage three to A level uh, science, which is ages eleven to eighteen, and we make we make student textbooks, we make teacher resources, we make assessment and uh, yeah, we make assessment, we make digital resources, we you know huge huge courses that we produce. Um, so I started, like I said, I started as an intern um, and eventually moved into a permanent job, um, and I worked in I worked throughout um, curriculum reform in the sort of early 2010s, um, that kind of whole process. So all of that kind of curriculum as they were sort of government was launching sort of new specifications that students had to teach, schools had to teach and students had to learn. And we were producing massive new courses uh, to support those new qualifications. Um, and um, as an editor, I sort of did a lot of work, sort of like proofreading, which you'd expect, um, a lot of in-depth content editing, working with authors to make sure content was on spec and was accurate. Um, and also did a lot of market research and working with our sort of more senior publishing team on feeding into product concepts and what our resources should look like and things. Um, and then after about four years, I uh, had a brief little sojourn into the international team at OUP who work on IGCC and IB and Caribbean and sort of, you know, international qualifications. And I worked a bit um, on maths and science, but also some other subjects like business and accounting. Um, and for that team, I was an editorial coordinator, which was a more project manager based role. So I sort of moved away from the hands on content editing and into a more project management role um, where I was then. Uh, I worked there for about six months before I was lured back to the UK uh, to be a project manager for science and maths. Um, so working across both of those lists now, working with the publishers and um, to sort of help uh, manage sort of basically the resources of the team, which could be anything from budget um, to our external suppliers to um, the capacity of our internal editors and just helping them to sort of deliver their product on time. Um, and yeah, like I said, I did that role for two years and I've now just been promoted to a, like I said, product program manager for primary maths and secondary subjects. So I'm going to be working across all of the subjects in secondary now. So the structure of the OUP education division is that we have an editorial team for each of the main secondary subjects. Um, and so I'm going to be managing the project managers for each of those teams, um, as well as working across um, a lot of the other departments. So obviously this is, that's sort of been working in editorial thus far, but um, now going to be working across all of the, like all the different departments, our digital department, design, marketing, et cetera, um, to coordinate our sort of key programs that kind of cross sort of all the things and getting them out on time. Um, so yeah, I mean, my obviously role has been a lot more editorial, but there's lots in publishing. There's, like I said, there's design and there's digital and there's marketing and sales and, all the other, all the other departments, there's, there's loads of them um, that are all involved in producing the textbook that you use that you probably haven't really thought about how that appeared on your desk. But um, yeah, and obviously during COVID, um, we've been working extremely hard to support teachers with remote learning. And there's been a huge, like a lot of teachers were quite getting interest, more interested in digital work and in digital content. And we've been shifting it's, that's really accelerated with COVID and sort of supporting remote learning and remote teaching. Um, I think that's probably a fair summary. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pass on to Simon now. 
Thank you, Sadie. Um, so yes, hi, my name is uh, Simon, Simon Williams, and uh, I am a STEM development, development editor at uh, Oxford University Press. Um, so uh, like, like one or two of our other speakers, uh, I actually feel slightly fraudulent as well, but for slightly different reasons, because uh, I've only been in this role for about uh, three months. Um, so I'll get to that. Uh, firstly, uh, I, to begin with, I went to uh, St Andrews University and I studied um, maths and theoretical physics. Um, and so <laughs> everyone talks about why they, uh, you know, what lab, uh, scientific careers outside of the lab. Unfortunately, with theoretical physics, working in the lab was never really going to be an option for me. Um, and while I was at uh, St Andrews, uh, I was president of the Student Society, Student Physics Society, um, and that's one way which I really got interested in uh, science communication because I uh, was the magazine editor there at the time, and it was really rewarding to get you know communicate all of these cutting edge science um, experiments that the researchers were doing and try to deliver them to a wider audience. Um, and then uh, after that, I, well, I was abroad in America for a year, for a year, and then uh, I actually went to London um, and I was a professional personal tutor for a couple of years, so teaching um, maths, further maths, um, physics, uh, biology and chemistry, so all across the board um, in, to private clients. Um, and that was initially sort of planned as a stepping stone to move on to into uh, teaching, um, because at the time, certainly, um, it, you were if you went to a, applying for a private school positions, you uh, did not necessarily need a teaching degree in order to qualify. Uh, however, it did become apparent to me after I was uh, applying for several of these roles that while it may not strictly be necessary for you to have a teaching degree, uh, you would be up against other candidates who would have these teaching degrees and uh, it was a very tall order for you to um, prove it, you know, to, yeah, to get, <clears throat> land yourself such a position against such opposition. Um, so, Having tutored for a couple of years, I then decided, yes, I will train to be a teacher. And I actually went to uh, Durham uh, to do my teacher training. And uh, I actually did visit the Newcastle Centre for Life. So uh, I, can, I can verify that it is well worth a trip. Um, and I actually, I have to say that I actually found uh, doing the teacher training to be very stressful. Um, it was very, re very rewarding. I could. 100% see why teachers love the jobs, um, but I sadly felt I wasn't cut out for it. Um, so after leaving the teaching profession, I worked for a short period in uh, intellectual property because I was still interested in science communication and I thought that this might be a good match for my... Oh, sorry. That's going by. And I thought it would be a good match. However, although it was another one of these things, although um, they ask for a physics degree to become a physics patent attorney, however, there are various different branches of physics. And uh, whereas in, the, in physics, uh, in a physics patent attorney, you'd be more likely to be asked about uh, you know, lasers or um, other technological um, advances. Uh, theoretical physics with a uh, particle theory or general relativity or things like this, it isn't actually re particularly relevant to the intellectual property profession. Uh, and so I quickly decided that uh, my experience was not the most valuable um, in the intellectual property profession. So I returned to um, educational resources and I thought you know I still love my science communication how can I you know make more of a difference there and after 
working as a freelancer for um, several different companies, making educational resources, authoring them, editing them, copy editing them, um, this sort of thing. Uh, I was very fortunate and I landed my current role as a STEM development um, editor. Uh, and in this role, uh, I've only been doing it for three months, as I said, but um, this involves sort of not only the copy editing uh, and sort of looking through, looking for typos and uh, this sort of thing, uh, but it also involves working with various teams in cross science and maths to try and make sure that OUP products are the best products that uh, we can possibly bring out. So, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me in the chat. I think I'm the last speaker. <clears throat> Brilliant. Thank you, Simon. And sorry, I'm just making sure I'm not going to have any alarms going off. Um, thank you, Simon. And thank you also to, to all the other speakers very, very much. I found that really interesting and really useful. Um, I think that we do already have some questions in the chat. So before we kind of open everything up to the audience, I'll just take a look at those. Lucy, I know you've, you've already answered some. So thank you very much for that. I I think there is a question to Adam, actually. Adam, this, this is from Nia Harris, um, and she's asking, what kind of work experience is seen as beneficial to go into medical writing? Um, that's an interesting question. So I wouldn't say there's any specific experience that you would need, but in terms of um, experience that would be beneficial, I suppose it would be anything um, that show that that where you give given the opportunity to write um, and show that you've been developing your writing skills. Because um, obviously, when they're um, looking for uh, associate medical writers to join um, the medical agency, they'll um, w w want to know in the first instance that you're good at writing to some extent, or um, you know, there's a basis that, that they can work with. Um, so, I mean, if there's any experience where you can um, write in, in the scientific context, for example, for an uh, experience as a, a scientific journal or something like that, that would be ideal. But um, even if it's just like writing for, you know, the, your, the uni magazine or, for, for, or just for yourself or as like a blog or something like that, then that would be, be beneficial as well. But, I mean, for me, I don't have any specific experience. My only experience in terms of the writing was doing my dissertation really um but but yeah um anything where, you, where you're able to write basically that's that's good experience i'd say okay right. would you say sorry just jumping in with the quick question there would you say adam that most people who start in the role do have some sort of um sort of relevant experience like you said your experience with your uni your academic writing do you, do you think most people get the jobs? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a quite. Um, most people will have some some experience from mm. from their degree at least. Mm. Um, uh, some might have a little bit more more than that. They might have worked on it a little bit more. But um, yeah, I suppose ev everyone will have written something during the course of the degree, regardless of how scientific your degree is. But um, um, but but yeah, I, I suppose it depends on the. Um, company as well some might look for um, some actual like rip, um, uh, what's the word some like, actual experience in writing whereas others mm -hmm. were more kind of like um, they'll, they'll have like uh, they'll do like a writing test as part of their uh, hiring process and through that they'll be able to see um, what your quality of writing is like and based off that sure brilliant thank you um, yeah Nia, I hope that that answers your question. There is actually, I'm just looking through the chat and there is actually one more here for, for Adam as yes. well. <laughs> um, so this is from Katie, who's currently a second year pharmacology student and thinking about doing a master's. Um, and will specialization via a master's limit the type of medical writers she could apply to? Um, no, not at all, to be honest. When I think of um, my intake that I was hired with as an associate medical writer, so obviously I came from a chemistry background, 
Um, I think there's people, there's quite a few from like biological backgrounds. Uh, I think there's one that did zoology, another that did like forensic science. So like all different backgrounds, mm -hmm. but um, as long as we had a scientific background and had a good quality writing, that was um, kind of enough for us to to, um, to be accepted. And um, yeah, I mean, it, on, on the work that you do, it, there's um, like, if you're lucky, you're special out, you might come across your speciality um, in the work that you do, but a lot of the time it will just be what the client, what the client's work is revolved around. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, how you, what, what you do in your degree won't hinder um, uh, your chances at um, becoming a medical writer. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, Katie. I hope that um, that answers your question. I think that's all the, the questions in the chat. Um, right, I'd just like to open it up to the, the floor now. So if anybody would like to raise their hand and ask a question, we would, we would really love to hear from you. So um, please do that. I think my colleague Anne is gonna keep an eye on so that we don't, uh, we don't miss anybody, but please feel free to grasp the opportunity and put your questions to the, the speakers. Not whilst, whilst people are thinking, I have actually got, got, got a question if that is okay. Because I was struck in listening to I think virtually all of you talk about, well, it kind of illustrates the fact that career paths are seldom straight lines. <laughs> um, and I'm guessing that a, a lot of people listening to this are currently kind of wrestling with their kind of first step, how to make a useful first step. Um, what is my question exactly? I guess my question is this to, to kind of all the panelists is, what do you wish you'd known about your careers when you were perhaps in the final year of your degree? I don't know if anybody would, anybody on the panel would like to start with that. Kind of unmute their mic and go for it, Laura. Thank you. Um, I, th I think that the often when you talk to scientists or you talk to to people and you ask them what what was it that that decided that they would set off on this career, um, it makes it sound often that that everybody has to have this Damascene moment where they they suddenly realise what they're destined for and off they go and chase after it. Um, and it just it it still hasn't happened. Maybe it will. Maybe I'll decide to do a proper career next week. Um, <laughs> But, but all the way through, if I look back, I, I should have been a bit kinder to myself about not knowing exactly what I wanted to do, because that's fine. So I've just gone and done things that I thought looked fun or that I would enjoy. And actually, that's that's not been a bad, a bad set of options. Um, there definitely was no light bulb moment where I thought, oh, this is the job for me. Um, mm -hmm. oh, that looks interesting. I'll go and do that for a bit. And that looks interesting. I'll do a bit more of that. Um, but there definitely wasn't a, a moment of revelation. Sure, that's that, that's reassuring. Yeah, think about being kind as well, being kind to yourself about it. Kind of similar to um, sorry, similar to what Laura is saying. I I went into my internship at OUP on a sort of vague like ah oh, editorial publishing. That's a kind of vague idea. I went into it and quite quickly realised that actually my skill set is in project management. So even though I'm still in the publishing industry, I like tailored my editorial roles into sort of the more project management side of things and have managed to you know carve myself project management and program management opportunities in my current business and, um, and that's what I'm more interested in so I think if you'd have asked me in my final year I would have been like yeah editorial you know like or working with science and stuff and actually now I'm like having had a chance to be an adult and work and <laughs> do some proper work and all that jazz I've discovered that actually I would just really like organizing people um, and so that's what I'm like, that's what I've been focusing on. And so um, I think, so there's always a little bit, which is kind of, I've sort of left my, the content of my degree behind a little bit now in focusing on project management, but my degree in having, and starting off in science as a science editor did help me get to like work out what it is I wanted to do and get to that point. So I don't mm -hmm. consider it, even if I'm not using 
that science knowledge anymore. So. Sure, yeah, thank you, thank you. Anybody else on the panel like to, my, to add anything to that? My job existed in my third year as an undergraduate. So, um, and I've, I've ended up here, as I said, by, by a set of, you know, well, yes, just looking for things that I thought might be entertaining to do. Um, and I think the, my, my background in research and in teaching and um, in the degree that I first did in my PhD, I've always had to be something of a jack of all trades. And I think that that's actually come through really well in, in what I do now. So actually, I find that there are things I've done in the past, um, which I didn't do deliberately, but they've actually been really helpful to me now. And I guess the, the one thing that kind of works all the way through is like, I kind of like talking. Um, and um, when I was at school, I did lots of acting and public speaking and things like that. And, and you know, just the urge to have people forced to sit and listen to me. It's, it's, it's a very... Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, right. I, I'd like to, um, yeah, re reinforce that. But I think one thing that's very important is that people shouldn't have any preconceived notions about what a job will entail or what it will be like. Um, so for instance, uh, I mentioned during my talk that uh, I really wanted to be a teacher. And when I actually, when it actually came to doing the teaching, um, I found that I wasn't cut out for it. Um, and, but at the same time, it's always, you can always find an angle with what you've been, with the experiences that you've got, what you can do, you can tailor it to um, particular roles. So for instance, you know, I may not be in the classroom anymore, but the teaching uh, experience, you know, the pedagog bad pedagogical background that I've got uh, from doing that teaching was very uh, important in getting me to the role that I am today. So even if you don't, even if you start off not sure whether the job, the job that you are applying for might, you know, is not the thing that you can ultimately see yourself doing it, whatever it is, it will give you, be valuable in getting your skills for where you want to go. Um, and one more thing, which I think is very important, um, was that my time at the student society uh, doing the physics, uh, student societies are absolutely brilliant at getting you experience in things which might otherwise be relatively difficult to get. For instance, um, you know, if you have the opportunity to serve as the captain um, of a team or something like that, that can get you um, project, you know, experience of overseeing a team, being able to deliver some results, which you might not necessarily get if you went straight into a, um, you know, a junior role. Um, mm. So if, if, if the opportunity is available to you, I really recommend that you make the most of it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I just wanted to make sure that nobody in the audience had any, any hand, anybody wanted to put their hand up and, oh, sorry, and there is a question in the chat from Rosie Cross, and this is to, to all of the panel. So Rosie is a second year biology student, and she's looking at doing a placement year. So I think that'll be between the second and final year of her degree. Um, she's asking, did anybody on the panel do a placement year? And do you know if your work placements offer placements currently? <laughs> so that, that's to um, everyone on the panel. I don't know who'd like to go first with that. I didn't do a placement, um, though I know of people who have with this sort of thing, but um, we don't do that kind of um, year long placement at the museum, but we do, for example, have people doing the careers development module with us, uh, careers for biologists with us, um, and general volunteering with us. And actually, if you want to get into the voluntary sector, whether that's something, you know, kind of heritage like a museum, science comedy like a museum, um, or whether that's other areas of the voluntary sector, then having a, um, a volunteering background is actually quite mm. important um, as part of that is the way you get your experience. Brilliant, thank you. Does anybody else, oh, Laura, 
Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't do a placement um, when I was at university, although I did work um, throughout, so I'd weekends and, and summers in the same role, so it probably added up to about a year's worth uh, in the end. Um, we don't offer placement is at the Franklin yet, but we will probably starting next year. Um, but if you're interested in communications placements, um, I would definitely have a look at what UKRI offer. Um, so UKRI are the, um, the organisation that fund all UK research effectively. They, uh, it's the government's um, arm's length funding body for research. And they offer really nice communications placements in all sorts of research institutes in their um, national facilities and in their, um, their head office, which is in Swindon, which is, you know, one consideration um but but it's really interest really really interesting projects and you do get um good proximity to some to some quite quite a good range of um of research communication types and um, so definitely have a look at, at ukri if you're interested there brilliant thank you on behalf of swindon <laughs> right um does anybody else on the panel would anybody else like to like to say anything about hi joss um, i've just put a message in the chat because i wanted to copy it across accurately from um, the people that work internally on these sorts of placements that we offer oh, this isn't my area so I've just posted that Rosie I hope that's helpful uh, but yeah we absolutely do sort of have internships and placements that we offer to get people experience in in school and, and see if you like teaching if it's something that gives you energy if you like being around young people a lot of that is paused at the minute as I'm sure you can appreciate with with the COVID um, but we will be at starting those from autumn again so if people on the call are interested in education I definitely think it's something that if you can get an experience with young people and just see how that makes you feel if it sets you on fire um, we definitely have those opportunities. Okay brilliant thank you very much okay right I think I'm kind of aware that we're probably coming towards the end of our time. So I think we've, we've got all the questions in the chat and I'm just having a final look for any hands, but, but no, we don't have any. So what I'm going to do, just, just as we finish, I'm just going to go back to my slides a moment and hopefully share those with you because I've just got a little bit more information that we, we wanted to give you. So hopefully, every, could I see a, whoops, can I have a thumbs up if somebody can see my slides? Brilliant, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, so before I kind of move on to this, I just want to say an absolutely huge thank you to all of our panelists for coming along, um, sharing their experiences. Um, I hope you found it helpful. I certainly found it helpful. I found it inspiring. Um, and if you have been inspired, if this has got you thinking, then I just wanted to flag up some of the things you could look at to take this forward. Um, if you haven't already discovered it, on the occupational pages of the Careers Service website, we've got an entire section dedicated to the different kind of occupations you could look at if you'd like to use your science outside the laboratory. So there are lots of profiles, job roles, interesting organizations, ways of getting experience. Um, so that's that. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, there are lots of events going on in this series. I think that there's still kind of the legal sector to come and something around um, marketing and then perhaps some other things, but all the details are there on the Career Service website. Um, and as a reminder to you as students, that um, on the career service website, if you're looking for vacancies, everything from part-time jobs to graduate jobs, you'll find that on my career. And also, if you'd like to book an appointment to pick up on any of this, to kind of talk it through with somebody, you can book that via my career as well. Um, 